Hey, man. Hey. How are I, you? Uh, I just sort of catfished everybody on my TikTok by going say? live. Yeah. And uh, this is our first live episode as well. Yeah. Oh, we should maybe tell the Discord. Yeah, we probably should. I will drop it in the Discord. Yeah, just drop it in the um, Discord. But yeah, so yeah. this is our first live episode of GPT. And uh, yeah. we don't know how this is going to go. No. <laughs> <laughs> we have no opportunity to mess up. Yeah. Um, but usually it's quite straightforward. Usually there's nothing we, we add it out. It's just like one long conversation. Yeah, pretty much. So if you're new here, which I suspect some people are, this is the GPT podcast. It's actually episode eight of the yeah. GPT podcast where uh, we talk about AI, the future of technology, and what's going on in this crazy world of software, which we can't really explain, while we drink tea. So this week... I forgot what tea I have. Oh, I have the Radiance tea. Ooh, very yeah. nice. So this is another Pucker blend. Man, we shout out Pucker so much. Yeah. Oh, man. Pucker, if you're watching, get at us for a for a sponsorship deal. But this is um, a Pucker Radiance, which is like a peppermint nettle kind of spiel. And very your nice. one is a mint refresh, which is like minty, mm -hmm. but it has a hint of rose. Okay, I haven't even tried it yet. It's really I'm good. way too distracted with the fact that we're live. Do you like rose flavored things? Um, I mean, I can't remember a single thing I've eaten that's, that tastes like a rose. Really? Oh, dude, there is, um, I need to actually get some. There is this like rose syrup, um, that you mix in with like super cold milk okay. and it's like unbelievably delicious and it makes, it's like super pink. It makes yeah. the milk really, really pink. Okay. And it's really, really good. I'll okay. get some. So uh, I've got the. You got the comments up? There we go. Oh, mate, you're testing right. my eyesight there. Yeah. <laughs> Callum yeah. said hello. Hey, Callum. Callum who? You. Lazy Callum. Lyrics Callum? Yeah. Oh, so. Lazy Lyrics. Hey, man. Yeah. Um, cool. Oh, I didn't drop it in the Discord. I'll drop it in the Discord. Do you want to whack oh, it so, in the Discord? So unorthodox. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. This is the first live episode. So, so maybe, try run. You, maybe you can just like tell the live viewers who haven't watched yeah. before what we actually do here. Like... What, what we do, we've, what we've spoken we about like last episode and, and who we are as well. Yeah. Why the hell should you listen to us? Uh, we well, shouldn't. <laughs> no, you should. No, you shouldn't. Uh, okay. Uh, so basically, um, I'm Danny. That's Hugh. And we are two dudes building a company called Carter. It doesn't really feel like a company. It more feels like some kind of just like an engineering project. Yeah, pretty that's much. That's the legal vessel, but it's more of just like a <laughs> yeah. research mission to bring some awesome tech into the world. Yeah, man, absolutely. So we've been on this on this mission for best part of a year, pretty much, um, and it's been super fun. So what we are basically trying to do is we are trying to build the most comprehensive and sort of like emotionally meaningful. Uh, AI sidekick for everybody that just becomes everybody's friend or long-term partner or companion, whatever the relationship uh, you would most enjoy. Um, we're basically building that. And, and we're also building out something called plugins, which is coming soon, super exciting, uh, which basically lets these AI sidekicks move off of just talking to you to actually being able to do stuff for you and like automate parts of your life. So anybody that's coming to this video from my live stream, they're probably coming from the Roomba video. Um, the Roomba video is like a very intensely aggressive uh, communicator, which we'll get into. Yes. But uh, with plugins, you'd be able to get the Roomba to like, I don't know, say, hey, Roomba, go home. Or if you give it arms, you can say, hey, Roomba, do something with your arms. <laughs> 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 and it'll be able to do it. So that's the, that's the basic yeah. vibe. That's what we're doing. This tea is amazing. Good, no? But I have already forgotten what it's called. Uh, mint refresh. So it's like peppermint. It's like three types of mint. It's like peppermint, spearmint, and mint, and rose. It's got like a hint of rose. Can you taste a little rosy? What's a? I can. It's like a sweet. It's like a sweet floral taste. Yeah. I've never eaten a rose. I'll give. I'll get you some rose uh, biscuits, and you'll be able to distinctly like match the flavors. They're really good. We're going to rename the podcast to GPT Rose Biscuits. Yeah, sponsored by Pucker. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Cool, man. Okay, so uh, previous episodes, we've been talking about all things to do with open AI, AI in general, yeah. the open source community, all these crazy things that are going on. Yeah. This week, we've got a ton to talk about. We actually missed a week 
Um, yeah. Because we were super busy in dev mode. So we've got two weeks of stuff to catch up on. What yeah. uh, is the first topic that's jumping out at you, dude? It's a slow, it's it's actually been quite uh, in a slow week last week in AI. Mm. Um, like the amount of announcements are, is slowing down. We had this like ridiculous explosion a few weeks back where we just, we actually couldn't fit everything in on the podcast. Mm. Um, and we could have just spoken for like three hours, but uh, two yeah. was enough. Um, and so n- now we've had a week off, there's actually a bunch to go through. Mm-hmm. So I thought the coolest thing I've seen so far Mm-hmm. Um, is actually something that's very familiar to us, which is NVIDIA have just done a demo. Of, yes, they have. Um, AI-powered NPCs in yeah. a VR game, mm-hmm. and it is exceptional. Mm-hmm. It's really cool. If you haven't seen it, go and see it. Yeah. Um, and, and basically, it's just this guy behind a bar. Mm-hmm. You can walk up to him, you can talk to him, mm-hmm. and it's contextually relevant in the game. Yeah. This is so important. We, of course, believe this is the future mm-hmm. here at Carter. Um, these these characters are going to just take on their own life and mm-hmm. they're going to start walking around and, and being considered friends mm-hmm. and and partners and, and whatever. And the first step of that is to have like really seamless conversation that's in keeping with the narrative of the game. Mm-hmm. And it looks like NVIDIA has, has done a really great job of this. Mm-hmm. The thing that really amazed me was the speed. So like if you, if you get a response from like an LLM at the moment, um, a good response from an LLM, it will take a couple of seconds. And to synthesize the audio is, again, another couple of seconds. But NVIDIA are doing this in like one second. It's yeah. very, very fast. I'm not sure whether it was slightly manicured. Um, mm, these but it things was, are always slightly manicured. Yeah. <laughs> but but nevertheless, it's very impressive. Yeah. So it was, a, it was a simulation of a pastry chef or something like this, or a barista? He was like a sci-fi... It was like a sci-fi kitchen. I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't know what it was quite supposed to be. Yeah, so this is something that's really, really... Um, it's been bubbling up and and the excitement for like AI based sentient NPCs that you can talk to that learn you, um, there is a ton of excitement for it. Mm. And so we started to see when we, I mean, when we started Carter, it was like the core focus was around AI based NPCs um, because it was just like the, the amount of story and the amount of different sort of like gameplay and game modes that you can get from that type of technology is like infinite. Yeah. And so super exciting. And so we saw the first bubbles of this with just some like hacky projects. So there, there was like Modbox, which was really interesting. Mm. Somebody put GPT-2, I think, into a into a VR game, something like that. Um, and then fast forward, there was that uh, Stanford paper mm. that went super, Very super nice. popular on Twitter. That it was basically, if you haven't seen the Stanford paper, it was um, a team at Stanford collabed with Microsoft? I can't remember. They collabed yeah. with some, some, some big tech company. And they basically, um, built a little simulation. It was like a 2D, it looked like a Nintendo DS game, uh, but it was like a it was like a 2D kind of uh, top-down simulation of these tiny little NPCs, um, but they were, they were AI-based NPCs and they were completely autonomous, uh, yeah. if you remember. So they lived their own life, they decided when to go to sleep, when, yeah. to, when to wake up, they decided who to talk to. They also could learn about the person that they were talking to and then go to person number three and then take the context of conversation one into conversation two. Yeah. They're fully autonomous and they just built their own complete storyline and people were like blown away because this, this is very, very exciting. Like this isn't just a game. It's like an entire simulated world mm. that you're entering into. Mm. Um, so now NVIDIA are really chasing this down, um, which is very interesting. I wonder yeah. how they're going to kind of roll it out to the market. Yeah. I remember um, when I was in school, changing classes i think i went up or down a set in right one in maths okay and uh when i entered the new class it felt like i had to like sync up with the timeline like it's almost like when you you have a day off sick at school mm-hmm. and you have to like figure out all the drama and everything that's happened while you were away mm-hmm. uh i think the games are going to feel like this in the future mm-hmm. where you, you drop into a game and the characters are completely simulated and gener- and just generating their own drama and their own storyline. Yeah. And you as the player are going to try and have to like, you're going to have to try and integrate into the social environment, mm-hmm. not just complete the checkpoints of the game. Mm-hmm. It's going to be like a complete social experience that's unique to you in the game. Mm-hmm. No one else has played that storyline. And you can put things, it's not just like it's you're seeing a play um, sort of, in front of you you know it's not pre-recorded you can sort of throw things into the world 
Like you could go up to a guy and be like, that guy over there, I hate him. Mm. And when you come back in two weeks, all of this stuff has happened because you did that thing. Almost like the butterfly effect in mm -hmm. time travel. It's like, it's there's this like knock on effect all throughout the world. Yeah. Yeah, this is this is really interesting. I wonder if um so I can I can see a scenario where some people could get a little bit annoyed with this concept. Mm. Um and the reason I say that is that game studios game studios are probably the businesses that understand human psychology the most. They know they are the best at like acquiring players and also keeping them. Uh well, the best game studios are really good at this uh, anyway. So for a game studio, when you're creating the, the arc of the game, I imagine a very, very important component of that is like understanding how the human feels within the storyline. Mm -hmm. So how many games are there out there where you're the main player and you're kind of like the underdog and you emerge as the hero and you save people and you save the, the wounded and you kill the vicious guys. You feel like the main character and you feel like you've like had an impact on this world. Um, and so game studios, get that right and they run through a bunch of tests and a bunch of like focus groups and a bunch of alpha releases and early, uh, early test pilots to make sure that the player feels a certain way when they play that game assassin's yeah. creed is a great example yeah. you did you see the trailer of assassin's creed where that guard like pushed the the woman down and like grabbed her kid she was a mother and then Ezio came over in the coolest way possible and just like sliced up this guard and then the other guards came and they just all drew their swords out and a bunch of assassins dove off of the top of the building and just like like landed on them with with their knives. Do you see that? No, I didn't see that. This was one of the most epic game trailers. But the feeling that you got from that is like, oh my god, I want to play as Ezio mm. because he just saved the day. He was just yeah. he was amazing. If you've got AI based NPCs and one of them, if you go up to one and you have a bit of an argument and you're like, well, you're a you're a bit of a, a muppet. I don't want to talk to you. And that one then becomes popular with the other NPCs. Yeah, you could be you could become the background character. We spoke about this briefly, but that would feel pretty crap, to mm. be honest. I want, I, well, maybe it was, maybe it would, or maybe you feel like, okay, now it's time to go and socialize and get back up the leaderboard or something. I don't know. It would. Be, it's it's just like life. This is life in a different place. I think it's yeah, and then, but then you also have time which I think a lot of people are overlooking right now. So okay. um, it's not that you can just talk to characters and they talk back. It's also the evolution of that relationship over time. So when you're playing a game on day one, you're like, mm. cool, I'm in the city. It's GTA, I'm in the city and I can talk to anyone. This is awesome. But what about after two years of playing the game, mm -hmm. um, you meet a new NPC mm. and they have been speaking to someone you used to know in the game. Mm. from from 18 months ago mm -hmm. and it was like years ago in game time mm -hmm. and there's just like this huge depth just when you you've been in a community in the real world for a really long time you mm -hmm. know everyone you know how everyone is i just wonder what's going to happen when you persist that relationship over a long amount of time mm. and that's going to be really weird it's also going to be really hard to turn that game off yeah it will be especially if people m basically migrate their social life into that game it'll be very hard do you do you remember those old videos back in like 2013 ish where um it was like a little bit of a trend where parents were deleting or locking their children's world of warcraft accounts do you remember oh like my was, God. do you remember yes. that old video where that where that kid raged in his room because his parents locked him out of his world of warcraft account yeah, I do vaguely remember this. Yeah, it went super viral. It got like 100, 130 million views or something. Um, but that was that was a super interesting phenomenon. I, I I watched a lot of these videos where where people were just like crying their eyes out or they were having massive ten uh, temper tantrums because um, they couldn't access their World of Warcraft account anymore. In a world where you've got AI-based NPCs that you can dive into at any time, you can catch up with people, and you can migrate your entire social life in there. And you can also get, get a bunch of validation mm -hmm. from a place like that. If you were to then turn that game off, let's say the game studio goes bankrupt or something, that could have a serious detrimental effect on a lot of people. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is, um, this is the most compelling use of blockchain I have ever seen. Okay. Which is that um, actually having an, a world 
that's full of like AI characters that can't be turned off may be beneficial. Yeah. It's like the, yeah, blockchain uses are, okay, can you, can you unpack that a bit more? Well, there are a few things if, if you read um, Matthew Ball's Metaverse book, it mm. goes into great depth as to like why this might actually be useful. Um, but I feel like cryptocurrency and blockchain technology in general is a little bit ahead of the need for it. Mm. But I actually think that the more attached to these games we get, the more time we spend in them, um, the more need there will be for a digital form of currency and the more that need there will be for persistence regardless of an organization overseeing it. Um, and so some sort of like globally synchronized world where everybody agrees that if you put your bag down here in mm. the game, you can come back to it and it will be there. Mm. There's like, um, at the moment, you're it's up to the game studio to persist that. Mm. So if they decide they've, they've run out of money or they just want to bring out a new title, your bag's not going to be there. And that's a really simple example, but it might be, like you said, the social relationships you've developed with NPCs, mm -hmm. or it could be a fort that you've been building in Minecraft for three years, mm. and now it's just, poof, gone. Yeah, so so this is very interesting. It, it seems like the company that has done this the best so far is not actually a blockchain company, but it's um, CCP. So uh, the people that run EVE Online, we had the yeah. pleasure of uh, being able to speak to Helmer, mm. who, uh, who's the CEO of, of CCP and a fascinating dude. And he gave that presentation um, about how he runs EVE Online. So people that don't know EVE Online, it's like a massive, massive game. It's been around since 2003, I think. Long time. Yeah, long very, time. very long time. Um, and it's like, a, it's a very intense uh massive it's like the biggest mmorpg there is or something like that at least one of the biggest maybe top three um in terms of just space and, and things to do and this game is run in a very very unique way so it's very much ownership based so the way that you progress in the game is you've got like three clans i think and you need to make your clan win against the others. It's very territorial. You need to buy ships, you need to buy equipment, you can trade. It's got an entire like financial ecosystem within this game. And the way that they run this is not with blockchain or anything or not with a cryptocurrency, but they have like a board of governance, essentially, essentially like mods and super mods and like layers of mods uh, that are just like power users, yeah. uh, power players of a game that end up coming, like sitting on a council and they decide um, they basically decide how the game progresses and they decide if, if they, and, and, and if they are unhappy with something that CCP, uh, does, they literally protest inside of the game. So, uh, they gave the, Hilmar gave the example of there, there was something that they did that the players weren't happy with. And so for 48 hours straight, they just shot at one statue. And that was incredibly intensive to, to maintain, but everybody shot at one statue until CCP changed their changed their ways. So it seems like yes, blockchain could be could be something. Although just having some form of governance structure, some kind of decentralized governance structure yeah. would work for an environment like this. I think it's a hint at what will work if we do go down the metaverse route. We're gonna need much, much better internet. And so, oh, yeah. so like an, a simple example, I, we might have mentioned it on the podcast before, but a simple example is um, let's just say we are in the metaverse, whatever that looks like. And we are like shooting each other, just like a FPS these days online. Mm -hmm. At the moment you have a company who owns a server that validates whether I shot you or not. And if I didn't, then you don't die. If I did, you do die. And there's like a bunch of magic going on to, to like figure out what the ground truth is. And they have some really smart techniques for figuring out like your latency and your connection to the server, my latency, my connection to the server, what frame of the game am I rendering on my PC compared to yours. You might be playing on a laptop. I might be playing out, out, out on like a maxed out gaming tower or something. So there's loads of like elements of um, how the affect how the game's rendered and mm. presented to each player. And it has to feel fluid for the player as well. You can't mm. have any lag. So um, there's some really amazing techniques for, for solving this. 
The problem is, is if you remove the company or you add multiple companies that are providing that experience, now you don't have a ground source of truth anymore. Mm. So let, and, and do you want one company to look after something that big? Probably not. Like if you look at the size of Fortnite, that's a huge game or Minecraft, it's a huge game, but it's still one company that's validating the ground source of truth. When you go to the metaverse and we're talking about like interoperability of worlds passing through them and stuff, now you need an open standard to validate the source truth mm -hmm. because I might be playing with a, I don't know, maybe the, maybe it's like a gun that I got from the Call of Duty side of the metaverse. Mm -hmm. You might have got yours from Fortnite and we meet in the middle to have this like interaction. Who validates that interaction? At the moment, there isn't really a way of doing that. And so you need two things. You need a way of uh, openly validating a digital source of truth. Currently, the best offering is blockchain, but it's super complicated and very, very, it's very slow, hungry. It's slow. Mm. There's a bunch of issues and reasons why we're not really doing that much at the moment. Mm. Um, but also internet, just internet speeds need to be exceptional. They mm. need to be like 5G or higher at least. Mm. Um, and even then there's a question of like, okay, let's say you had zero latency. Then you just have a bunch of culture arguments of like, um, okay, the system said this happened, but I'm going to believe that it didn't. You know, mm. there's like, maybe you can reject the source of truth. Because if it's open, who are, who are we to tell you that that's the source of truth? It's like a whole, it's like a whole can of worms. Yeah, I don't, I, I'm not convinced that the technology to support something like this even exists yet, to be honest. Like, okay, take the example, we're talking about AI based NPCs. Basically, forget, forget NPCs. We're talking about AI based entities. Like, yeah, AI synthetic life. Mm, that's, yeah, they're it gets like a bit digital murky. people, they're digital beings. Yeah, they don't. Yeah, digital beings. They don't necessarily need to be people. Um, mm. But yeah, so if you take AI-based beings and you say, okay, we're going to persist, like the the your personality and your context and everything that you've experienced, your 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 history um, is persisted mm. without being reliant on any company because it's written to the blockchain. If you've got a character that's running autonomously. Uh, that's building its own memories. So when you're not playing the game, it's still like the AI Sally is still talking to AI Mike and getting the context from that that um, relationship and that conversation. And it's writing autonomously to the blockchain to record its memory and record its life experience. And you have, I don't know, millions of, of AI-based beings you would need a system that can essentially scale infinitely. Yeah. Which I'm not convinced we're, we're at or even close to. Yeah. I mean, we have some awesome theories internally of how it's going to play out mm. and some awesome ideas on technology as well as culture. But I, it really is one of those things that's it's just, a, it's just a theory and there's so much speculation in, in the AI space, but also in the metaverse space, that it's very, very unclear how it's going to play out. Mm. I think it's more likely that a couple of big games start to bleed into one another and the answer kind mm. of ends up presenting itself. So maybe Fortnite gets a little bit too big and merges with GTA or something like weird like that. Whoa, yeah. A collab between a collab between two massive games. Yeah, but it might even be Could a be mod. It might be a mod community. Like it might be that someone invents uh, is a free idea, but it's like the community, the, the game developers themselves mm. don't actually touch their game. There's just this insane mod community that's built this glue that glues every experience together. Um, there's some interesting things going on in VR that can make, for example, any game made in Unreal 4 a VR game. And like, wow, yeah. So it's there's like some crazy open source projects where people are just trying to force games to be compatible with the way they want to consume them. Mm. So who knows? I think that the the solution will present itself, but I think it's a few years out. At yeah. least it's it's a few years out. It's not around the corner. the The things that are around the corner are equally as exciting, but For they sure. won't be like massively interoperable. We probably won't have these digital beings that are able to move freely across games without an uh, a company looking after them because yeah, you not still just need yet. to store them somewhere yeah yeah not just yet but things are getting really exciting things that yeah. we're to be honest things that we're doing at Carter are super exciting um and we're we're moving 
closer. We're pushing the ball up the field. Um, this NVIDIA demo was was super exciting. Mm. I'm just happy that there's a lot of attention to it. When there's attention to something, we usually progress comes yeah. after, which is exciting. Yeah. Demand, demand for solutions is a powerful thing. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. For sure. What else is going on? Oh, like a ton of stuff. Um, I mean, we've had a bunch of interest in Carter just to stick on that subject. Yes, we have. Um, which is super exciting. We try and keep Carter speak to a minimum on the GPT podcast. We want yeah. it to be its own thing. We don't want it to be like salesy or, or whatever, but we mm. but we are super proud of the work we do. Um, yeah, it's more so about the content. People have just been loving consuming the the stuff that we're doing here. Yeah. And the, 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 the key, the behind the scenes thing to know about the RoboChad uh, dude and also just like May helping with the potentiometer Mm -hmm. is that these were just like random off the cuff videos. Yeah. It wasn't like, oh, let's do this thing. It was like, no, we are doing like a full YouTube video on RoboChad, yeah. but more so about the build. Yeah. Um, but just having a chat with him, I was lying over there and just having a chat with him. I was like, roll the camera, see if he says anything funny. If he does, I'll post it. Um, he sassed me like yeah. insane amounts and people like me getting insulted yeah and oh so, great we'll stick yeah. with that <laughs> yeah let's stick with it <laughs> yeah and is so that, uh, is that a privilege reserved only for ai or do the people in the office get to insult you too uh hmm <laughs> yes if they can take an insulting back okay, okay, okay. <laughs> um, that'd be a funny video just yeah that would be each other. Yeah. uh yeah so so <laughs> this um this 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 is this was very very interesting. People just love the idea of things talking to them, of technology mm. talking to them. Mm. Like even in the Robro Chad um, comments, people are like, "I want this for every single one of my appliances." Can you imagine how loud your house would be yeah, all the time? Just like just chaos. It would yeah. not be a Zen experience. It would not be. And imagine <laughs> if if your Roomba is like, it's not about you talking to your Roomba. But your Roomba is like m having a mad argument with the fridge, <laughs> who just massively insulted the coffee machine, and so so that's not turning on. So you can't have your morning coffee. Yeah, It'd be a madhouse. But that's the that's the NPC thing the Stanford did, but in the real world. Yeah, there's, yeah. there's like law in your kitchen. There's law. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Three weeks ago, Danny did this the one thing like yeah, <laughs> yeah. And now we talk about it every day. <laughs> yeah, man. Oh, bro. But can you imagine like? how cool like okay it's a bit it's a bit weird but if you if you could actually have like inside jokes with your toaster oh yeah like not gonna lie <laughs> i would so. love that i would actually love that yeah i think some people would love it i would i would certainly love it i think mm. everyone who works at castle would love that yeah not everybody would like i don't think my mum would like that no i don't i think there might be certain people would think it was amusing I, it depends how invasive it is yeah. If it's like, ah, uh, that was the right moment and that was hilarious, mm. I think anyone would love it because it's just yeah. like another human. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, okay, so moving on from, from Carter, if you're interested yeah. in what we're doing at Carter, just like hop into the Discord. Um, yeah, and if you're watching this live and you like the content, thank you very much. Uh, a lot more to come. We've been messing around with, do we say the appliance or do we wait to... We have to wait. You have to wait. There's, a, there's another appliance. There's another appliance that has coming been... soon has gone for a correction. Yeah, has yeah. <laughs> yeah, gone for a correction, yeah. Yeah, so um, that's super exciting. What else yeah. is going on? So there's a bunch of stuff. Let's speed through it. I've got, I've got three things on this list that I want to cover. Okay, um, man. So the first thing is, there's something called the Open LLM Leaderboard. Super in the weeds. But um, if you've used ChatGPT, that is, an op that is using a large language model. That particular model is GPT Turbo 3.5, GPT 3.5 Turbo. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a couple of different versions and it's awesome. Now you've got GPT-4 as well. These are both LLMs. There's a huge open source community working on large language models that you can just run on your machine. Um, and the latest um, is something called Falcon, mm. which has absolutely smashed it. So it's a 40B model. So it's like a quarter of the size of GPT-3. Mm -hmm. And it's absolutely blown all the Llama models out the water. Like wow. it's, it's just like performing a lot better um, and it has a much more per permissive license so you can just use it if you're a developer and if you want to use it for commercial use you just need to ask permission um so who so uh, it's together compute that built this it's not together compute so it's a company called tii tii I'm not sure what it, that stands for um but yeah so they will allow you to use it for commercial use although it's unclear whether they start charging you after a certain capacity 
That's weird. Is that classed as open source or just free? Well, that's up to the audience to decide. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay. Fair enough. Um, wow, very exciting. 40B yeah. model. Yeah, yeah. So so that's very exciting. So there's going to be a bunch of things happening in the LLM world over the next few months, I think. Mm. There's going to there's a few projects that are really really gaining momentum. You got like Open Llama, you've got Together Compute with their Red Pajama series. Mm -hmm. They all have weird names. Um and a bunch more that that are ticking over Open Assistant as well. There's just a bunch of really awesome projects. I mm -hmm. think we might see some Bloom related projects coming out as well. They released last week or maybe the week before this uh, star coder model, mm -hmm. which is um, it's an LLM that's been fine-tuned on uh, coding. Mm -hmm. And it's exceptionally good at writing code, wow. which is great because Copilot X, which will be closed source, is around the corner. So you can see mm -hmm. like the open source community and the closed source community are sort of having this tug of war. Mm -hmm. um, but I would have said that open source is winning by a mile right now. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to beat. It's a million plus developers working 24 seven for free all around the world. It's, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty hard. Um, okay, so this topic is very interesting. Um, we were, if you if you rewind time, November 2022-ish, we were blown away by ChatGPT um, and the kind of offerings in the LLM space were not very many. There was obviously GPT-3. That was kind of like the, the, the spearhead, the one that was super exciting. There was Bloom, that was huge. That was super expensive to run. And there wasn't much else that was comparable performance. There was like smaller models. There was GPT-2 and like a bunch of stuff in Hugging Face. Um, and so if you really wanted some great performance from a from a from from an LLM, you'd have to go to GPT-3 or you'd have to host Bloom. Now we're getting to a point where there are so many models out. Mm. There's stuff from Stability. There's, stuff, there's just tons of stuff. Um, and there's also this race to uh, race in the open source community of who can get the best open source uh, LLM as well. And so it's very, very rapidly getting to a place where it's kind of a, it's, it's kind of a commodity type business type right. type industry is like whoever's got the best model for the cheapest. And yeah. also these models are getting smaller and smaller and smaller whilst maintaining the same or even higher levels of, of performance. Yeah. So what, what do you think this looks like in six to 12 months or even further out? What, 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 what do you think we're trending to in the LLM space? I think we're probably trending to it not mattering what model you use. Um, and most models for most tasks will have comparable performance. There will be a leaderboard still, but it's going to become super in the weeds, like half a percent increase, like that, you know, like that sort of actually half a percent is quite big, but like, mm. you know, very, very tiny, tiny increases. It'll be like um, graphics performance. Yeah, yeah. Like it's, the hard cores like, do that, but not not many, not everybody using Windows does. Exactly, you know? exactly. You're, you're basically, it's going to become a non is mm -hmm. you're just gonna like yeah it's powered by an llm mm -hmm. next it's like databases there's so many databases um what might be interesting is uh that there will be tasks that these systems still cannot do mm -hmm. very well um so it might be strategic planning or absorbing the right amount of context there's a lot of there's a lot of work going on to squeezing more information in a prompt into an LLM at the moment. Mm. So that's called the context length. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at 3.5, which is ChatGPT, you have a context length of, I think, 4,000 tokens. Mm. Token is like a fraction of a word, piece of a word. Yeah. So you can have about 4,000 of those um, in your prompt before it can't really see the beginning of it. Mm -hmm. It just has like this sliding window. And then you've got people like uh, Anthropic um, who have like, a hundred thousand token length now, mm. much bigger. Uh, GPT-4 also has a very large. I think it out the box it was thirty thousand tokens, but mm. I'm sure they're worth it, working on increasing that to a hundred thousand. Um, it's it's very it's moving very fast. But what that means is that these systems can absorb more context, mm -hmm. so they can understand, like for example, an entire legal document and then answer questions on it, or an entire book, or maybe the whole Harry Potter series, and then write another one. So there's like so much context you can cram into these models now and that will increase. I think we'll probably next year, I always say next year and it's like two weeks. Mm. Yeah. But, yeah. But next year, I think we will get infinite context length. I think there'll be a huge leap forward where context length isn't a thing anymore. Mm. There's some smart thing going on and there's, there's interesting things going on with training. So that's the other thing. So training an LLM is very expensive. Mm -hmm. We're talking tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions 
of dollars to mm -hmm. train a system like this from scratch. Right. Then there's another thing you can do, which is fine tuning. So it's taking an existing model and it's just training it for a little bit longer on your specific task. And then it performs a lot better on that task. Yeah, standing on the shoulders of giants. Exactly. Now that is still expensive, but it's getting very cheap now. So uh, a paper last week or the week before came out, um, which is this new technique called Culora. Mm -hmm. Don't ask me what it stands for, I've forgotten already. But basically what this means is that you can train at a very, um, you can train with a lot less compute and you can get um, comparable performance out of the model at the mm -hmm. end. That's the, the easy five seconds. So it's, it's much less compute. So it might be that you can have a large language model on your phone. On a, in the paper, it lists a iPhone 12. So this is not even wow. a current phone. This is from yeah. a few years back. And you could have your phone fine tune the model for you while you sleep on the day, on everything it's absorbed in a day. Yeah, so this, this is now, this is very, very interesting. When you can run very performant models on the edge, how like so there's, there's there's all this talk bubbling up about regulation and like governing bodies coming in uh coming in and governing bodies being set up to, for like ai safety and stuff sam altman was in congress now he's doing his world tour and he's he's talking to like rishi sunak and stuff about yeah. ai safety when you can run highly performant models on the edge no offline uh and just like on your phone mm. How could you ever possibly regulate a system like that? So it would have to be by the corporates, the device manufacturers, no? Maybe, but then like, if you look at NVIDIA, right? NVIDIA are like at the heart of most AI research. Arguably today, they're providing all the chips that are needed to train these models. Um, and if you're training something like GPT-4, maybe you need, I don't know, it's unknown, but maybe you need 30,000 GPUs. Mm -hmm. um, and if you want to run Llama on your home machine, you just need the game's graphics card you already it already has in it. Um, but that's still probably su supplied by NVIDIA unless you have an AMD, but most of them are NVIDIA. And so uh, maybe they could do something, but there's no real knowledge they have of the computation you are carrying out on mm -hmm. the chip. Like they don't know, you're passing it numbers. They don't know whether those numbers represent words or maybe they represent nuclear launch codes. Like mm -hmm. it's it's unknown. Um, and so maybe they could help enforce some sort of regulation, but I think it's unlikely. Mm -hmm. What they could do is limit the amount of GPUs anyone can buy without a license. But then what you have is you you basically have a law that is not going to age well because that regulation will be good at first, but as computation gets more efficient, as we're seeing with QLaura, you need less and less compute power to do the same task. Yeah, we just... like. It we'll just engineer our way out of the problem. It was like that that thing that you brought up a couple of podcasts, uh, a couple of episodes ago about drones. No drone can be over what, 300 grams or something? 250 grams. 250 yeah. grams. Well, without a pilot license. Without a get, license, yeah. 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 And so pilot. companies are like, right, forget getting our users to get a license. We'll just engineer it so that it's 249 grams. Yeah, and they proudly have that on the side of the drone now. Yeah, and we were <laughs> joking, like if you wanted to start a drone company, 249G would be a great, company name it uh, would. for a drone there you go another another idea yeah. make drones called 249g.com um but we would just do the same thing with ai if it's like oh you need a license to run x model um or yeah. x size model we would just get the model i mean it's already happening these models are getting so small if you're saying that a 40b model is now comparable to gpt force performance in a lot of stuff gpt force what 500b 400b nobody knows nobody knows um but if it's comparable in performance for most stuff, it's like that's a there's going to be hard to regulate. Yeah, yeah it really care, it really depends what you care about. Most people care about like writing an email or summarizing a document. This will be done on the edge by an LLM mostly by the end of 2024. I would have said that's my prediction. Like it will probably work its way onto your phone this year somehow, probably through like Apple or Google. Um, and then by the end of next year, you'll just have it. It might even be part of your keyboard. Like maybe there's a button on your keyboard and it just auto replies to whatever app you're in. There mm. you go, Apple. There's one from me. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, or it might then, just be autonomous, dude. Yeah, it could be. Okay, so that's, that's one thing. 
maybe the AI just represents you mm. and like you just have this assistant that's always doing things for you. Um, join the Discord. Uh, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, but you also have uh, other use cases for AI, which is much more scary. Mm. So just as you can teach an AI to be like, here's the ingredients for it uh, I have in my fridge. What cake can I make? You can also ask an AI Here's all of the materials I have in my lab. What horrible thing can I can I make? Like, like a, a bomb a, or something. Yeah, it could be something like that. And so that's kind of a little bit more scary. And so the main, I think the winning argument right now is that regulation is done based on, we need to replace the word of intelligence with capability. I think Sam Altman said that. Okay. So um, it will be regulated by capability of model. And this won't be something that you can 100% trust. It's just a basically a rule to abide by. So you probably will get an underground community that pops up that are just breaking the rules. But you will also, the, the one maybe saving grace is that most powerful models will be too expensive for an underground community to train. Uh, I don't, I, may, maybe for the majority of them, but I think if there is the, where, where there is profit to be made, a, a consortium of, of, mobsters let's call right. them for a safe way consortium of of el like illicit people will emerge that yeah. have p that have money to be able to do something like this i, I find the capability thing the, the capability argument is interesting and it definitely is is i can i can see how that plays out in more black and white examples like okay if this model has the capability of mixing elements together that can be incredibly corrosive or explosive or something fine that's a model that you need a license for However, for example, with Carter, we need something that's great at just like talking to right. somebody and getting close to somebody. Yeah. Now that can in 99.999% in, in of cases be a very positive thing. You can meet a loved one, a friend or whatever. But if that same system... Ooh, oh no. How does this The light got bored. I think it ran board. out of battery, dude. Okay, that's fine. It can be in darkness. Yeah, that's fine. Do the, how do these charge? Is it battery? Yeah. Oh, okay. Maybe yeah, one was on charge, one wasn't on charge. Yeah, okay, never mind. Um, if you get in the, if you get like a very, very good model that's fine-tuned on how to build rapport, mm. yes, you could use that to build close, meaningful, productive, positive relationships with people, or you could use it as like a mass gaslighting system. So right. that's very okay. much of a gray area Yeah. in terms of, cap it's capable, it's not being used for it, but it can. I think most models are like this. Yeah, I think time will tell. There's going to be an initial wave of regulation that probably lasts 18 months. Mm -hmm. And in that 18 months, we'll see the whole research community adapt to that. Some will get licenses, some won't. Like there will be a whole, whatever they choose to do, there's going to be pushback as well. Mm -hmm. so they have to do something probably and uh, they're going to want to do something to seem responsible. Mm -hmm. Also, governments aren't going to want to limit their ability to compete with other countries and things. So it's like a whole can of worms. We've been in it a lot. We've done this a lot on the podcast, but mm -hmm. I think time will tell. It certainly seems like there's going to be something that's presented this year in most countries. There's going to be some sort of um, idea of what the AI regulation landscape is going to be. But I just don't think that um, it's going to be as deep as people think it is i think mostly the regulation is going to be around high risk uses yeah and the open source community is going to be mostly left alone yeah that's what i would that's my prediction yeah i mean yeah. to be honest it's so hard to predict so time yeah. will tell Let's yeah see. so the, okay so a, a couple of things to to sort of finish up um sam altman is uh flying around the world at the moment yeah. ceo of open ai world tour world tour uh, and this is super interesting. It, it's kind of tied into regulation as well. He, he's talking to a lot of governments and mm -hmm. things. Um, but if you want to learn about AI and you feel a little bit behind, I recommend just looking for some of his speeches because it won't give you like in the weeds how do these systems work, but it will give you an idea of what the future is going to look like because the level of conversation they're having is like very, very accessible. It's mm -hmm. very, very easy to understand, which is really, really nice. Mm -hmm. So if anyone is feeling a little bit um, concerned about AI or they just don't understand it and they want to know more, look at those Sam Altman talks. 
they're popping up every couple of days because every couple of days he's doing a new event and they're yeah. putting it on YouTube. Mm -hmm. So this is super interesting. Have you seen any of them? Uh, I haven't seen any of the talks. Uh, I am going to go look at them. I did see that he met him. Uh, it was him, Demis Hassabis, who's the founder of DeepMind mm. and the Anthropic CEO, I think, all met with Rishi Sunak um, to discuss how the UK can become like a, a, a technology leader an AI leader in the space. So he's definitely making, Sam is definitely making ripples. I think this, this kind of like world tour meeting different governments and different teams and stuff is a very, very smart play from OpenAI and from yeah. Sam. It's setting them up. Basically nobody was talking about OpenAI eight months ago. Mm -hmm. Nobody was. And they have, yet they have got themselves in a position where they feel like an incumbent that's always been around. They feel like the establishment. And this just bolsters onto that. So Sam going around and, and talking to different governments about what AI is going to look like and how we can keep it safe means that he will have a a very heavy hand mm. in the regulation for a lot of these these companies. And of course, it's going to be favorable <laughs> for yeah. open AI. Um, but yeah, I agree. If you want to learn about AI and just kind of in general terms of, of what's going on, Sam's talks would be a good idea to watch. Yeah, uh, and then and you can go into more depth. Um, so I have another recommendation for content, actually, which is not a topic, but I, I was just watching it earlier and a couple of people at the office have been watching it as well, mm. which is um, Kapathy's talk at the Microsoft Build event mm. on, I think it's called the State of GPT. Mm -hmm. um, very, very good. It's very, very, uh, it gives you a good idea as to how the systems work, how they're trained, um, the methods that work, the methods that don't work, the methods that are cheap to train the systems and the methods that are expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and also, crucially, this is the best part of the talk, how to communicate with these systems. Mm. Because communicating with these systems is not as easy as it first seems. Mm -hmm. You can get a lot more out of the system if you just do some basic things. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you are talking to ChatGPT, rather than have a two-way conversation, try and get the first message to be as useful as possible. The best advice is to treat it as if you were emailing a contractor that you could not send a follow-up email to. So this would be like very painstaking, painstaking detail, especially mm -hmm. for GPT-4, because it can pick up on all of those little things. Mm -hmm. um, you want to really lay out exactly what you want um, in the response, mm -hmm. exactly how to do it or how you might do it, anything that's contextually relevant, and you can also trick it. So for example, you might say, write me a story and it'll give you a story. Mm -hmm. But if you say you are an exceptional storyteller, you've been doing this for 30 years. Mm -hmm. First, tell me about yourself and then write me a story. Mm -hmm. So what you'll what happens is then you have um, what they called uh, computation over tokens. So basically, uh, this is super in the weeds, but it makes a lot of sense. Um, if you ask for a yes, no answer from an LLM, it has one shot of getting that right with one word, mm. right? And so its error rate is actually really high mm. because it, it doesn't really have, it's just completing the next word in a loop. Mm. So if you're just completing one word, there isn't much computation, but all the computation goes into that one word. And so you have a high error rate because it can't correct itself as it's writing the sentence. Mm -hmm. But if you say, explain to me why this is or isn't the case step by step, think mm -hmm. step by step. There's an awesome paper about that. Um, it will write you this whole essay and it will, as it's writing it, be paying attention to what, there's actually something called the attention me mechanism in these systems, um, paying attention to what it was, has already written. Mm -hmm. And what that results in is a much, much higher accuracy. Mm -hmm. So if you're talking to these systems, think about how much chance are you gi giving it to get it right? Have you given explicit instructions to do so? Um, and I I really encourage people to use the rewrite button in ChatGPT where you can mm. edit your message and send it again. This is very good. Um, and then the, the other tip, which is just from me, they didn't say this in the talk, is um, try starting a fresh conversation. If, if something's going off on a tangent, start a fresh conversation with it mm. because it's using all of the messages in that conversation as context. Mm -hmm. So if it started writing bad code, don't use the same chat. It will yeah. use that and it'll go, oh, we're writing bad code, are we? Yeah. And, and, so, and it'll do that and yeah. it'll write and it'll add spelling mistakes and things because 
it thinks that's what it's supposed to be doing. That's the that's the best that's the best example. Yeah, so. this is this is really fascinating. So one thing that I have been doing in my prompts when I'm talking to ChatGPT recently that's been performing incredibly well. What was I doing? I was talking to Hay uh, Haywa, who's building the game, mm. uh, who's building Carter Game, which is like super exciting. We were talking about like a potential like feature of like how to make the game really cool and like fun to play, and I think it was something about. I can't remember exactly what it was about, but basically I wanted ChatGPT Chat GPT to do a thing. Right. And I gave it all of the context in my first message, spent a lot of, lot of time on the first prompt. And then I said, okay, generate 10 ways that you would do X thing. With each uh, item in your list, generate why this, explain why this will work and then explain why it won't work and then explain how you could do it better. Wow. Um, and so for each each item in the list, it gave me the idea, it gave me why it would, be, it would be successful, why it may not be successful, and what to do instead. And so in that first generation, it uh, was basically correcting itself within that first, yes. that first run. And it came up with some phenomenal ideas like phenomenal, phenomenal ideas. And then, and also the reason that, uh, the reasons that it said that it wouldn't, maybe this wouldn't work because of X, mm. I hadn't even considered. For me, that was an unknown unknown. But because it was, it was, I, I asked it to, to evaluate its own response and give me something better. Yeah. I ended up with an amazing, amazing response back. That was now like, hey, was like, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. That's super interesting. So yeah, so that's computation over tokens. Mm. And it's like a very, very simple thing. It's like, how hard is the problem and how many words are you giving it the opportunity to write? Because the, the difference between a GPT model or any LLM and a human is that a GPT model can't undo what it's done. So like, yeah, you could argue humans are the same, but we can correct ourselves these models aren't really able to do that. So if they predict the wrong word, they'll just carry on on that wrong direction. Mm. So if they say like, if you say, what is four plus four? And they say, the answer is nine because it, even though it might know it's wrong as it finishes that sentence, it has no opportunity to rewrite that. Mm. It's going to just continue and justify why the answer is nine, not eight. Yeah. But if you say, think of step-by-step step, or in your case is like, um, why is this wrong? That's so so much better because you give an opportunity for the system to make a mistake mm -hmm. and a, a space for it to rewrite its answer. Mm -hmm. So I haven't tried that myself, but that's very interesting. I would love to play around with an AI system where the conversation wasn't turn by turn, where it was like an AI system can send multiple messages or it can, uh, it can ask you to follow up now, but it can send multiple messages it can understand your message and understand if there's something else that you want to say and therefore it doesn't reply. Like for example, when I text, I send a lot of small messages. When you text, you send like one massive thing. Yeah, you send um, like 40 pings on my phone. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah, it's Sometimes, all about attention. I must admit, I just mute until you finished, <laughs> finish the WhatsApp blast. Yeah, to I'm be like, honest, okay, sometimes okay, you you do this with your voice notes, you like, you like backtrack a lot in your voice notes and I just have to skip with you being humble. And I'm just like, <laughs> I may be wrong about this. I'm not entirely sure. I need to do more research. Like, okay, let's just get to the point. So I do it in text form. Um, Guilty. Yeah. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm really curious to see what it's like for an AI model to understand that it needs more context from you right. or you're typing something else. Um, for it to be able to say, I think you should do this. Actually, wait, 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 hold on. I've changed my mind. I think you should do this. Yeah. And have like a many to many kind of conversation. That's I think that would be very, very interesting. And yeah. also have the AI start conversations as well. Yeah, absolutely. You yeah. should join the Discord. Yeah, uh, we're working on some <laughs> things like that. Yeah, we, we, we've got some awesome, awesome things um, yeah, man. in the works. Uh, and then finally, uh, yeah. something we completely ignored when it was announced, completely ignored, I believe, um, the Alexa LLM. What? What's yeah, that? Amazon, Amazon is training. They announced, I don't think it's yet accessible through AWS. I did um, not see this. Yeah, they announced they are training their own model. Um, it's not ready yet uh, on the Alexa data set. And Ooh, that's going to be very interesting. That is interesting. Or it might be just a rubbish data set because... 
I'm yeah, not sure whether I, the you, quality who talks of that. To Alexa yeah, is lot. it mostly what's the time? Mm. It, I, I wonder what I wonder what's in that data set. Um, and I'm excited to try it. But I think I think what they're I don't think it's gonna be just the Alexa use they use. I think it's gonna be heavily other data mm. and then maybe a little bit of the Alexa data if it's of any value. They have a lot of it. Yeah, but how I mean, yeah, but like how, who has any form of conversation with Alexa that's not small talk? I don't know. I mean, it's Amazon, so they've they're not gonna. I don't think they're gonna put out crap. Yeah, they won't. They won't. Absolutely not. And it will be an AWS service as well. So you just access it through an API, just like OpenAI has mm. done, um, which seems to be the trend now. So th that's interesting. But I, I think more exciting is that they now are using that data for something more tangible than just like a little uh, performance improvement of, of Alexa itself. Mm. So if you think about um, Alexa's voice data, they probably have the most valuable voice data set in the world. Yeah. Um, maybe Google has comparable data set, but I'm, I'm, from not, sure. I'm not sure. From From like Google Assistant and maybe Google searches through voice as well. Um, Mostly I think from probably YouTube. Maybe from YouTube. So mm. YouTube, but YouTube is a different context mm. where maybe Alexa and Google Assistant have the best voice data sets for, I don't know, training text-to-speech voices or something like mm -hmm. that, or making um, a voice recognition system that is way better than OpenAI's Whisper. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that there are going to be interesting uses of that data. I'm not sure an LLM is going to be the best use, but we'll find out. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Again, it goes back to the to the thing where anybody that has enough money to train one of these systems, probably uh, if they're in tech, they probably will um, for at least for the short to midterm. Or maybe they won't. It's just, it's very quickly becoming a commodity product. It's like mm. if everybody's got their own LLM and they're trying to actively like get people to use it. I mean, we've had an experience of that where a, a big company has reached out and they're like, we'll give you this, that and the other X, Y, Z all for free please just use our LLM. It's like very quickly becoming just a commodity. Um, yeah. And and like, wh where is the value in a cloud-based LLM when you can get really, really high performance on your device? I wonder. Yeah, I, I think it really depends what you're using it for and what your use case is. I think mm. actually if you're writing an email or something like that, there's actually a lot of value of having it on the edge. Because mm. it can just be like built into your keyboard. There's yeah. an extra button on your keyboard. You press it and it auto fills something for you. Yeah, that's like probably something we'll see very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, however, cloud-based uh, virtual research employees and things that kind of just work automatically. Um, this is something that there's a very good use for cloud. Yeah, agreed. Um, where like there's a shared experience maybe between maybe you have a team of six people and they all talk to the same assistant. And it helps you run your business right. as like a AI manager or an AI assistant for everybody with all that context. Yeah. So the so the kind of the the multiplayer agent, but the one that, uh, and also the one that that needs access to the internet can yeah. follow you around places. Yeah. All of these things. It makes sense for that for that to be on the cloud. Yeah, of course. But things like just just like email writing and like uh, there's there's a bunch of um everything ai is getting turned on to or uh, mm. turned on in all of these different SaaS products like notion and now helps you write better notes and stuff i don't know if that's going to be a service i think that's just going to be a part of your operating system yeah. on your phone you know so you don't need that to be online <laughs> this is interesting and i also think that this is going to be this is going to happen very quickly. So um, you have like, we know that uh, AI is going to be implemented in every Google product and every Microsoft 365. Um, but last week, uh, Microsoft did another event, mm -hmm. uh, Microsoft Build, mm -hmm. and they announced that um, not only are we going to put it in every in like Word and Excel and everything, we're also going to put it in your command line. We're going to mm -hmm. put it baked into the OS as yeah. like a sidebar. Mm -hmm. um, and it's paperclip. Paperclip is coming yeah, back. Paperclip's coming back. <laughs> yeah, um, it's going to be everywhere, and it's going to yeah. be like there's going to be browsers that are optimized for AI. Mm -hmm. so that they can properly see what you're looking at. And like, mm -hmm. there's going to be all sorts of stuff coming out of the woodwork. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of cool. It's kind of like, I kind of think a lot of work is going to feel like terminal work from like 
the 70s and 80s of yeah. like using the terminal on a computer to communicate with it rather than buttons and clicks. Yeah. Now we're going to be using our keyboards again. So we're all going to look like cool hackers, but we're actually just talking to an AI. Yeah. 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 I, I, I do think the fundamental way of how we interact with technology is just going to change. Like if I was running a normal like SaaS company right now, that's mm. like, I don't know, some financial reporting software thing, whatever, I would be pretty worried because it's like, oh, we make, I don't know, accounting or email automation super, super easy that you don't even need to, it's just a couple of clicks and everything is done. It gets pinged out here and, the, and you pass all of these filters. It's not just the case that they are solving that problem and therefore you carry on using that. It's the fact that AI can make that no longer a problem at yeah. all. Yeah. When you're, if you're a company and you're the best solution to a problem, that's great because that means you're, you're in a great position. You still have to be competitive because there are other people trying to solve that problem. AI isn't trying to solve the problem. It's making the problem go away. And so if, if, the, if, you're, if your company is a solution to a problem that is solved, no longer exists, how can you, how can you justify any form of market cap there? Yeah, so the, the perfect example to, to build on that, we, we, we butchered this topic in an earlier podcast episode, but actually this is really, really important and I have a better way of describing it now. Mm. So uh, let's say you are a startup, you're awesome, you have an awesome team and the product you make is an email app, right? Okay. It just helps you organize your emails better. Yeah. Um, and so there's this new AI tool that will design... Um, a new UI, uh, like instantly. It's like Figma, but it's like click of a button. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're like, awesome, let's use AI for that. And then so that tool gets a bunch of hype because it's like, wow, we can design UIs with AI now. How awesome is that? But will people be using an email client that was designed by the AI? Like they won't need an email client. Mm. It'll just be like an automated service. You, maybe you won't even use email. You will always use communication, mm. but, it, but the percentage of communication that you do is going to go down. Mm -hmm. And especially the time spent in that app is mm -hmm. going to go down massively, not up. Mm. So maybe AI is in the design tool. Maybe AI is in the email client, helping you write emails and draft them. Or a few years out, it knows you so well that it's just an automated service. It's just replying to emails for you. It just knows yeah. everything about your life and it's just it's just doing the work for you. And so you never install the email client that was designed by the AI. Yeah, I mean, it's it's no different to the like 1800s. Like previously, if you were if you were in the in the not the 1800s, or maybe in the 1800s, but if you were in the 1920s and you were running a big business. Um, and you had a bunch of correspondence. It previously was mail <laughs> before it yeah. gathered the E, but it was mail. Um, you weren't writing out responses to all of these all of these um, messages that were flying at you. You had uh, typewriters, right? Like you had yeah. you had people sitting secretaries that would, that were writing out um, your messages for you. And what they would do is they would be like, they would first sort through all of the emails you get. Okay, that's an ad. That one is a cold outreach, yes. blah, blah, blah. These five are important. Yes. You say, um, I don't know, Mrs. Smith, you've got these five emails that are really important to reply to. Uh, what do you want to say? And Mrs. Smith is like, okay, for this person, just say basically, yeah, let's meet on Monday 6. For that person, say, yeah, that deal's done. We'll yeah. do it 20K. You just say, okay, the rough sentiment of what you want. And then they go away, go away draft the response and send it back. That I, I feel like we're going to go back to that. We kind of moved away from that, but with like, yeah. dear, blah, blah, blah. We fully will. Hope you're well. Yes. <laughs> we you should do this. It's just going to be, it's, be in your AirPods. You're out for a jog. Oh, uh, Brian has just messaged you and he's wondering if you're free for dinner on Thursday, 8, 8 a.m. Say, uh, can we do Friday instead and just say, um, congrats on the new baby? And it'll just draft the whole email the way that you would. Yeah, I, I actually think it might go a step further. Okay. So if you think about in the 1920s, your assistant would um, would maybe say exactly what you said to them. Mm. Or maybe you just give them a general goal. And you'd be like, okay, this person that sent this letter, um, I don't really know very well, but I want to get to know them because I think I could do business with them. Mm. And um, the only thing I know about them is that they love cars. Mm. Um, can you like start some sort of like letter-based relationship? 
and just manage it. And when you think it's hot enough, I'll hop in and we'll meet, we'll actually meet in person. Mm. I think that that's probably more, more like it. Yeah. So it might be that your friend emails you and your or the AI emails you and your AI says, I'm available on this day. Um, it's kind of like almost a bit like what APIs are supposed to be, mm-hmm. where you have to have this communication between everything mm-hmm. um, in a digital space, but it's going to be immediately interpretable by the humans. Mm-hmm. So um, I think it'll make decisions for you. And I think that p- different people will want different levels of that. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's some incredible use cases and there's going to be a lot of things that um, are unstoppable regardless of how disruptive they are because mm. of how small a hop it is from current technology and so it won't be regulated and um how impactful it is so like one of those things is education mm. um homework's gonna have to change really quick there's, oh my there's God, really no yeah. way around it um there's this this is like a whole thing um but there's really no way around it there's like a lot of schools and universities are sort of screaming about like different detection methods mm. or how they're going to approach it, which is super exciting mm. that the education is willing to listen that there is a change. Yeah, this is I, exciting. There's a really funny story about this. So I, I, I went uh, I went to my nan's house this this weekend. I was talking to my little cousins, and there was somebody in in um, my little cousin's school that uh, got in trouble because they didn't do their homework, um, and they'd previously been caught using ChatGPT to do their homework. And so they got a detention. Um, uh, Yeah, they got a a detention and they were like, right, you you need to do this homework. But you have known to you, I know that you've used ChatGPT before, so you have to do it in person. You have to do this homework in class, okay? In a detention. And it was in an ICT lab. Or maybe it wasn't an ICT lab, but he had his laptop. So the teacher was there and he had to do this homework. The teacher like popped out to go to the bathroom for two seconds, quickly logged onto ChatGPT, generated everything and just and just printed it. And then the teacher came back. He had to stay there for longer. Like mm. he was pretending that he was doing it. Um, but yeah, even in person, he just quickly, it was like 30 seconds, boop, boop, yeah. generate, bang. It's like, dude, if you can cheat in person and you don't get caught, yeah, like, the, the, homework is over or yeah. the current face of homework is over. Yeah, I think it's now is a great ch- a great opportunity for governments and uh, schools and universities to really, really evaluate what we actually value from students mm. and invent new 100%. ways of of delivering that education because we still need to know stuff. It's just how we're like marking people is not really a rep. It's never really been a representation of the the intelligence Mm. and um it has and now it's also doesn't have any value because um sure maybe in school they can force you to write the essay in front of them i mean that'll increase staffing costs a lot like yeah um but when they get out to the real world they actually need to know how to use chat gpt yeah but dude i'm not entirely convinced so basically what you're saying is schools place a lot of importance on like memorization of stuff and grunt work whereas they should move to more like reasoning based work. Now I completely agree. However, I'm I'm not convinced that that gets the majority of students out the woodworks at all. Um, so for example, diagnosticians, becoming a diagnostician. So basically somebody that comes in with an illness, nobody has a clue what it is. Diagnostician goes and like tries to pokes them, prods them, gives them different stuff to try and figure out what they have. Um, and then they they find out what they have and they cure them and they go home. That is one of the hardest medical jobs to get. Incredibly, there's a great series actually on Amazon called House, Dr. House, Mm. which is like an amazing series about a diagnostician. Um, But that is one of the hardest uh, fields in in medicine. And it requires insane levels of of reasoning and insane levels of just cognitive ability to be able to be like, okay, they've got that, that, and that, but they don't have that, but they don't have that because of this. So therefore they have this very very tough job it doesn't come from memorization that you get that level of like ability to diagnose someone but they are one of the first medical jobs to to start evaporating because now you just give all of the symptoms to yeah. an ai based model it does all of the reasoning so so yeah so i think 
a li- I, th- I don't think that there's like a one thing that schools and education in general can do to to fight this. I kind of feel like there's a million small things they can do though. Okay. So, um, for example, uh, in your IT class, which is like once a week, if you're 12 years old or something, I, I can't remember. Yeah, once, twice a week. Well, once or twice a week. Um, teach them what an LLM is and how it works generally, not in lots of depth, um, how to use it properly. Like we just spoke on this podcast about um, computation over tokens and like mm. this sort of stuff will make them much better at prompting. Mm-hmm. Um, this will be as important as holding a pen, how you communicate to these systems. They're going to get better at communication. You're going to be able to say less to them and get more out of them. Mm-hmm. But it will be as, just as communication skills with other humans is really, really important and you don't really get taught it in schools. Um, the communication with with AI systems is going to be arguably more important. Um, so that that's one. Uh, another one would be uh, teach kids how to uh, like l- more about relationships and more mm-hmm. about like social dynamics, because this is probably something that AI will do, um, but humans will still be better at it for mm-hmm. a long time. Um, and this is, this drives basically everything, even in the business world, mm. um, relationships, who you know, how you feel about them. It's, it's kind of it underpins everything mm-hmm. in, in social life and in work life. Um, and it's the, often the reasons for things like promotions and it's often the reasons for things like your project getting funding and mm-hmm. like how people see you and how you present yourself is still going to matter a ton. Um, yeah. and, and then finally, um, start to wind down gradually things that are now going to be irrelevant going forwards and start to wind up the things that increase an individual's value in the world. So what do you think is going to be irrelevant? Um, I think a lot of basic, okay, so like writing a cover letter. Don't teach kids how to write a cover letter or a CV, um, but do it slowly. So like, just put less weight on it at the moment. So like my whole secondary school life, every year, there was like a whole month of how to write cover letters and and CVs. And it was a pain and I hated it. Um, And it does benefit some people, but now everyone's just using ChatGPT to write those. So soon enough, employers will stop asking for them Mm -hmm. and they will find a new way of hiring you. Um, So so those sort of things feel like they're going to be irrelevant. It's little things. Um, And then the bigger things are like, I very, very, very much believe that we need to encourage more human creativity. Mm -hmm. This is going to be valuable and it's going to stand the test of time because yes, AI will be able to make any form of creative output, Mm -hmm. but it will be useless if there isn't meaning injected into it. If it hasn't come from another person, it will have less value. It Mm -hmm. might still have some, but it will have, it will have less um, and honestly, I think most people get reward, internal reward from doing something creative mm-hmm. from something they, they tried to bring into the world. Um, I'm certainly like that, but even people I know who aren't creative, when they do a creative thing, they still feel good about it. Mm-hmm. This is going to be very important because I think we need to build up, um, we need to build up people's self-esteem and separate that from what they do as their work. Yeah. Um, a lot of people are asked, like, what are you going to be when you grow up? Um, it should be more like, what do you want to work on or what do you want to obsess over? Um, what what, do you, what interests you? What do you want to get involved in? Is mm-hmm. it a community? Is it an art project? Is it an engineering challenge? Is it something crazy like building a city on Mars? Like, mm. these things are so creative and far out there. Yeah. Um, and those are the things that are going to probably stand the test of time. Yeah, those would... Those- I, I completely agree. Um, I would say probably this this doesn't this doesn't fit for everybody. Um, but if you are so inclined to make content like video content of the things that you do and the things that you're interested in, this will probably have the biggest positive effect on your ability to get hired or yeah. to fundraise or to just just ba- kind of like do anything. So. Right now, a, like even for us when we're hiring, we basically don't even download the CV to, 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 to look at because we don't even know if it's, even now we don't know if it's going to be generated by ChatGPT. A lot of them are. Yeah. Um, and looking at a sheet of paper to try and sum someone up that you're going to be spending 10 hours a day with 
is just super, super ineffective. Like, you're, what are you going to learn from that? Mm. But every, so everybody that we've hired here, they've all had their own like portfolio of projects that they've worked on. They've had like a website where they've posted videos when they were like 14 and they're like 240p filmed on a, on a Motorola. But you can see that they, I don't know, made some kind of metallic arm lift up to feed the dog and then lift and then go back down or something like that. And that piece of content alone was like, okay, I understand this person. I understand their individual creativity. I can see passion. I can see so much. Um, and so I think one of the highest leverage things in this world where AI, we don't know yet what AI is going to take over. We don't know if entire degrees, the entire degree specializing in something like law, for example, is on the whole be going to become pretty irrelevant soon. We don't know what how much AI is going to take over. There's regulation that plays a plays a footing. But I think one thing that you can have that that is yours and that is a massive store of value, kind of regardless of anything else, is if you've got content of things that you're interested in. And you, it doesn't need to be big. You don't need to be the next KSI. Yeah. They can even be private videos. If you want them to be private videos that you can show to select people, maybe future employers or something, um, that's fine as well. But I would say definitely make the content. It, it's not going to harm you for sure. It will. It, I think it will really, really help you. Okay, I, I want to end on a question for you. Okay. And then we'll just cut, Dan. When you edit this, we'll just... Snip it. We can maybe do, I don't know, <laughs> what time is it? Do you want to do like five minutes and just go through some of the comments, see if anybody's got any questions? Okay, yeah, yeah. I can do. Yeah. Okay, but um, go for the question. So the question is, uh, in 10 years, so it's 2033, what job do you think will be most likely to be here? YouTuber or lawyer? <laughs> okay. Putting aside our biases and trying to think about this realistically and logically. So, I think I, lawyers... Yeah, yeah okay. I'd like to just add a caveat to that. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about the entire industry disappearing. I'm just talking about if you are a student studying law or content production right now, how likely is it in 10 years for you to still be in that industry? Just for you to still be doing that thing because of, because of technology. So this is very hard. This is a very hard question. And it's not, I mean, the immediate answer, if you don't give it too much thought, is like, ah, oh, lawyers do document generation and blah, 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 and they look at different documents. And so therefore, ChatGPT can do that. Therefore, lawyers will be replaced on on mass with a few st sticking around and starving. Whereas content creators, the individuality of a content creator is going to stay around because you can't really easily replicate that. That's the kind of easy example. However, there is the concept that at a certain level, in the legal space, you're not at all looking at documents. It's the stuff that associates are doing, it's stuff that the paralegals yeah. are doing. Your entire job is bringing in new clients. At the, at the top level of any of these finance and legal roles and these corporate roles, it's all sales. It's like if you become a, a partner at, uh, or like a managing director at a big at a big investment bank, you're just, a, you're, you're, you're winning new business. Um, and so I think the, the top lawyer, the top of the top uh, in corporate law and stuff, will still very much be around. Mm. Criminal law, I'd probably say the same because the criminals probably want the human relationship. There's also a lot of emotional things that go on in, in a courtroom with a jury and stuff that that great lawyers, are, great criminal lawyers are great at like playing the jury. So I think they're still going to be around. However, getting into the legal space mm. is going to be incredibly, incredibly difficult as a junior. Because as a junior... If you're just going through documents and highlighting stuff and, and looking at looking at different books, that job basically can be fully replaced. The human elements of the job remain, but the human elements for those types of jobs are locked, locked to the top senior level. Yeah. Whereas with content creators, it doesn't matter. There's no like level really. It's like, oh, you started making content. My content is different to your content. Even though we're we're spending most of our time together and we're building the same thing and we're very similar people, our content is completely different to each other because we're different people. Mm. We've got our own personal uh, authentic signature mm. and people like mine, people like yours, people like somebody else's, 
and there's no real barrier because I can follow as many people as I want. So I reckon maybe breaking into the industry of content creation will be easier, although I think a lot of people would pivot to it, but it would still, if you, you can you can have your own authentic voice. However, I think the top, top of the legal game is still gonna be there and they're gonna be paid more. Interesting. What are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, so like, uh, Initial thoughts would be uh, lawyers. Lawyers are going to be very, very difficult to find a human one, um, and the, like, oh, difficult to find. Difficult to like f- the the amount of people working in law is going to be much smaller, um, and the amount of people producing entertainment for humans is going to be much larger. Mm. That's like the initial thought. Maybe it goes that way. However, I can see another path emerging. Okay, which is um, it may become illegal and immoral to be represented by an AI because your argument will be so good (laughs) and so compelling and it will use 100% of the loopholes in the law, not just one or two that they managed to find through like some old book. Mm. It will be using 100% of the loopholes and it will be, you will not be able to argue with it. It will be so, it will be um, such good, so good at persuasive writing at storytelling, at tugging on your heartstrings, I think it'll become illegal. And so I think it will, I think only humans will be able to represent humans. How would it become illegal if I think it can just... defend itself? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, uh, the, the only justification. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, the only justification would be um, if for some reason hmm. the world's governments decide we must um, call digital beings like their own person, their own entity, and they get given rights. And then I think they'll be, they will be able to argue that of course they're allowed to represent a human because they too are a person and they have rights that like that. I mean, I want to be represented by an AI lawyer, maybe even now, Mm. but I just think it's going to be illegal. I just straight up. I just don't think it's going to be a thing because um, there's going to be this, unequal fight where you could have the world's best lawyer in that niche and still lose from AI because it has perfect memory. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I I don't think it's going to, it's going to affect law. Yeah. It's, there's going to be the biggest pushback for it to, to affect law because also any case that's won sets precedent for other cases of a similar nature. Yeah. And so if Everybody in the world has access, criminal, non-criminal, regardless of whatever you've done, every person has access to essentially a free or a very, very cheap legal representation that is the best in the world. You're, it's not going to lead to perfect law. It's going to, I think it might lead to chaos. And it's going to be something that the invisible hand just stops, I think. Yeah. It, it, there's also like, there are all these amazing, amazing uh, books and lawyers out there who can like, for example, get, there's a book called something like I Can Get You Out of a Parking Ticket. And okay. it's his favorite, it's this like famous lawyer who um, uses like the fact that you can't prove that the uh, camera was tested recently um, or that working properly, things like this mm. um, to, to win the argument. So for small cases, I think um, you wouldn't be able to use AI because it would be so good at creating doubt and for large cases, I would say it's probably too manipulative where if the stakes are higher, then the the evidence on both sides is going to be manipulated mm. to win that point. And the AI is always going to do a better job at that. And don't forget, the AI is going to have perfect history on every law case that has ever happened and been like digitally recorded. Mm. So it's going to be able to remember not only what the outcome was, but all the evidence and how that evidence was arranged to reach that outcome. Mm. I do think a lot of AI, AI will definitely be used outside of the courtroom though. I definitely do believe this. I think if you think about the majority of corporate law, it's not fight, It's not really, as far as I'm aware, I need to be better versed in this, but it's not all fighting in the courtroom and, and going through conflict. There's obviously corporate conflict as like an entire space. Most of it's like M&A stuff. Mm. It's like the paperwork of articles of association um, for, for funding rounds and also M&A, like yeah. transactions and, and stuff. A lo- I, I think a lot of the legal text for these types of transactions are boilerplate with with just the terms changed. Right. Um, and a lot of the grunt work for like an M&A transaction will be done yeah. by AI systems. Um, 
but then there is still the the the, the senior partner that has the personal relationship that brought the right. business in. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's just it's it'll be tough for the juniors trying to break in. Yeah, well, we'll see. I don't know because you you can. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with using AI to probably make in some cases better document. There's like a lot of companies. Mm. I'm guilty of this um, with like previous businesses and stuff. Like you can't afford a lawyer, so you just go and like find a template. Yeah, I did this it's with like previous like teenage stuff. businesses. Yeah, and yeah, stuff. yeah. And um, that is not the way to do it. But uh, there are people out there that do do that, and so there will be AI services that just tailor a document. There probably are already. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think it is against, for example, OpenAI's terms to do that. That's quite interesting. So, do you know Harvey from Suits? <laughs> well, yes, it's where the name comes from. But Harvey AI. Um, is that where the name comes from for Harvey AI? I'm pretty sure. I mean, you get a legal legal AI company called Harvey. <laughs> it's like, okay, okay. it's right there. Um, but Harvey raised 20 million from Andreessen, I think Andreessen or Sequoia, right, one okay. of those. I think from Sequoia. Um, raised 20 million. Uh, they're basically a legal AI company. Yeah. Um, and they're, they're, they're being used a lot. And as soon as uh, Harvey announced their fundraise or uh, in at the same time as they announced their fundraise they also had like i don't know a crazy investment from pwc yeah and some of the other um investment banks and some of the the financial world like i think jp morgan i, I don't want to misquote anything but a bunch of the top institutions no. that camera died uh, a bunch of the top institutions um, were like, okay, right, it's time to use this this yeah. tech. And I think a bunch of companies like set aside a budget for AI tools and Harvey was a big component. So it's, it's it's it seems like it's coming. I don't know what it's going to spill out to. But uh, but again, I would say if you're a kid right now and you want to be a lawyer. Uh, become a really good lawyer. Become a really <laughs> good lawyer. And probably start Definitely. right now. Just just uh, start yes. networking with some senior senior partners or whatever. Oh, yeah. It's the human part of the job yeah, that but, will get you it. But also learn to use AI to help you learn to become a better lawyer. Yes, absolutely. Like exp ask it to explain everything like you're five. Give it the yeah. whole document, then explain it to you, ask questions. That's like probably the best way to learn. Yeah, learn that's how I would moment. revise now. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Right. Well, thank you very much. This has been episode eight. If you're watching the live stream, uh, we can stick around for five minutes, five, 10 minutes and answer some yeah, questions yeah, if there are any good too. ones. But this has been episode eight of the GPT podcast. Thank you again for joining me, man. This Amazing. was fun. Pleasure as always. Yes. Until next time. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.